inviting me uh, to this wonderful place here. Uh, this very old school, very famous school. And uh, also to talk about these very interesting topics. And uh, I'd like to take the perspective now uh, from uh, looking at materials with the eyes of a material scientist, but the materials that we find uh, in uh, biological systems. And I decided for today to take a very special perspective. Uh, as Eve said, uh, we are all optimistic of uh, learning a lot of things from nature, but I'd like to start with the perspective of uh, Julian Allwood. So uh, this is uh, uh, a very interesting book that this person from Cambridge wrote. And um, I learned about it by Julian Allwood starting out a materials conference saying that if you take the energy problem seriously, please stop developing materials. So that was an interesting start from a materials conference. And so the, the idea behind this argument was the following. Well, if you take uh, a device, well, a device such as this, for example, uh, it contains an incredible number of different materials, uh, metals, plastics, semiconductors, rare earths, all kinds of things. It takes a lot of energy to make this. And then basically it's highly dangerous waste. And it takes, again, a lot of energy to disassemble everything if you would like to reuse or uh, um, recycle some of these materials. Now, if this was made out of one single material, we would just crush it and make it new. And uh, I think this is something that I thought uh, merits a second thought. And this is a little bit uh, the, the, the theme uh, that I would like uh, to put uh, in front of the talk. So it means that um, we should look at, we could look at smaller temperatures, for example, to save energy, small amounts of materials to save energy, a smaller variety of materials to save energy in recycling, and of course, a longer lifetime. And then this very, very naturally uh, brings you, as you will see, to biology. Now, uh, this uh, is very similar to one of the slides that Eve has already shown. And uh, you'll see the point I'll make with this. So this is just cross sections of uh, beams that are uh, meant uh, to provide a bending rigidity. And basically, uh, if, if I start here, if I take a square cross section, I get a certain bending rigidity. Now the same bending rigidity can be obtained with half the amount of material by just making this cross section, uh, a third of the amount of material with this cross section, and a quarter of the amount of material with this cross section. So that's one strategy. And of course, the other strategy is to do something to the chemistry to make the material stiffer. Again, you get a reduction in material just by preserving the shape or making it three times as stiff you have uh, another reduction uh, of the amount of material. Now basically, and you've said this Eve, before, you have these two strategies. So on the vertical direction, um, we have uh, chemistry. On the horizontal direction, we have geometry. And of course, uh, we can combine both. Uh, that's, uh, of course, uh, a very good strategy for uh, highly performant materials. But giving this a second thought, we can also now think about in terms of the Allwood uh, remark that um, having a too great a variety of materials might be um, a, how shall I say, a challenge for recycling and for energy on that side. I think it might be worth thinking about it that actually just by this geometric change, you get actually a much bigger reduction than by uh, chemistry. So a factor three in Young's modulus is quite substantial. While, uh, and you, you see that the, the material amount that you've saved is not nearly as much as what you can do by geometry. So I think um, maybe by including uh, into our design uh, um, strategies this uh, consideration of sustainability, we might come to quite different solutions. I mean, this is a little bit the idea. Now, of course, uh, natural systems are uh, sustainable by, by nature, I, was, <laughs> I would almost say, because of the uh, resources being recycled for, uh, for very natural reasons. 
And uh, therefore now I'll move a little bit to how to look uh, at nature. Now, the inspiration by nature is as old as humanity. And I'll show you a very um, simple example, in this case from Galileo Galilei, about geometric adaptation. So actually, this is the, the original drawing from his two sciences, where you see uh, the typical shape of a bone for a large animal and the typical shape of a bone for a small animal. And you can see the different aspect ratio. And this made him discover the concept of strength, actually, which I think was not, uh, was not very uh, well known before. So now, just let's make the, the, uh, the argument. So here is, a, here is an animal, scale it by a factor A. So I just increase all the dimensions by A. Then obviously, uh, if I suppose that the force is mostly governed by the weight, the force that is going to act uh, scales with the third power of A. Well, of course, the area of that uh, bone that will have to sustain the load scales only with uh, the square of A. And uh, this uh, lead, led to, the, to, the, to realize Galileo that if the force scales with A3 and the area scales with A square, then there must be a change in, uh, in the shape to accommodate this. And uh, so he recognized that uh, strength was an inherent material parameter and that, of course, since the strength foot was limiting the bone, you had to shape the, change the shape of the bones to adapt uh, to big animals. Now, this is a very interesting discovery, of course, and a very interesting concept, too. And then, uh, if you go to uh, the letters that uh, Galileo wrote to his daughter, uh, this is very nice. He was already an old man, and, his, and, and he just learned that a whale has stranded in Pisa. And, of course, he was, not, he was living in... I, not living in peace, of his rushing despite his age to the to the uh, to the seashore to verify whether the bone of the whale was actually like the bone of a big animal or like the bone of a small animal, and his theory was that it should be like the bone of a small animal because a whale was swimming and not walking, and what a disappointment! The bone of a whale is like the bone of a big animal and not like the bone of a small animal. And actually, uh, the, the misunderstanding or the, the error that uh, Galileo made is that it's not the weight that governs the force, it's actually the muscle strength. And, uh, and of course, the big animal has bigger muscles and pulls more strongly. And uh, therefore, uh, it, there's a good reason for having bones. So I just learned from my colleagues in orthopedics that if you stumble, uh, the force, the stress you get on your hip is 10 times your body weight. You may just calculate how much that is, if you wish. <laughs> Quite substantial. So now, um, this is now uh, the argument um, um, about our architecture. So here the architecture was just a change in, in aspect ratio. Now I show some steel objects. I hope uh, if you like this. Uh, wool, cable, honeycomb, something made of steel sheets, and even some architecture. And of course, these have very different properties, though they are of a relatively similar material, all, all different types of steels. And the reason I'm showing this is that I would like to make the point that um, this structuring here is done at very different scales. So of course, the architecture is at the meter scale, while the wall is at uh, the sub-millimeter scale, and so on. And uh, what nature is very good at is, uh, since this is a a bottom-up growth is to do this architecture on many, many scales. And here's just one of those examples. So this is a glass, a, the skeleton of a glass sponge uh, from the deep sea. And uh, here you can see the arrangement of the glass fibers in horizontal, vertical, and diagonals, like very much like in this uh, architectural here. But then, uh, just going down the scale, you realize that the glass fibers, they are not plain glass, so they are actually layered silica. Here are, here are some of the silica layers. In between the silica layers is a tiny amount of uh, organic matrix. And basically, oh, basically this is like uh, um, um, armored glass, uh, because uh, the armored glass uh, is a layered glass where if a crack uh, propagates through one of the layers, it's stopped at the interface and will not crack the next layer. So this glass gets, uh, gets much better strength than uh, a normal plain glass. 
The only difference to a typical man-made armored glass is that the glass layers are not millimeters, they are just 10 microns here. So you have many, many, many layers. And therefore, these glass fibers are, fibers are hardly, almost unbreakable. Now, this just shows you that here you get a, a, a very special mechanical property out of microstructure. The question is, is mechanics the only thing to talk about? Uh, and the answer is, of course, no. And uh, I just show you a few uh, examples here. One example here from literature. This is just the colors uh, of a butterfly wing, uh, which is made out of a fairly boring uh, chitin material that has no color at all. There is no uh, special uh, um, um, co coloring molecules in there, no dyes or anything. And the color comes uh, just from the periodic arrangement of these uh, lamellae in the wing. So there's also, so architectured materials, if they have the right length scale, can also, of course, manipulate light. Another example you carry around with yourself, this is the cornea of your eye. And uh, so the cornea of your eye, uh, very uh, simply speaking, is a composite made of collagen fibrils collagen fibers, so collagen, the same material you have in your bones and in your skin and in your tendons. And, well, very surprisingly, uh, this uh, tissue, as you know, of course, is transparent. So why is it transparent? Well, uh, I, I give you very briefly the trick and then show you some pictures to, to, to demonstrate this. So these fibers here, uh, of course, have a different refractive index than what is around the fibers, which is a very rich proteoglycan uh, matrix, proteoglycan rich matrix. So if you have a, a regular arrangement of fibers on an almost a lattice, then there is something that we call Bragg's law. This is uh, light diffraction. And uh, well, that's the only, this is a very simple equation, so I'll, I'll discuss it a little bit. So this is the spacing uh, between uh, the fibrils, essentially. This is the wavelength of light, and this is an integer, can be 0, 1, 2, so that's the orders of diffraction. And of course, the property of the sinus is that it has to be smaller than 1. So uh, if, if I make sure that 2 times the distance between fibrils is smaller than the wavelengths, then the only solution to that equation uh, is for uh, n equals zero and therefore theta equals zero, so there is no diffraction. So basically, um, in, a, in a regular grating, if the spacing between the diffracting elements is smaller, or two times this distance is smaller than the wavelengths, there cannot be diffraction. So that's the principle of an optical filter. And this is exactly what occurs, actually. So this is an electromicrograph in the cross-section of the cornea. And uh, this is the electromicrograph cross-section of the sclera. So if you look your neighbors into the eyes, you'll realize that the sclera is white. Now, why is the sclera white and the cornea transparent, although it's made of the exact same chemical composition? It's just a ball. Well, the reason is that um, in the cornea, you have a regular arrangement of fibrils with a very small distance. And this is the very same scale what's going on in the sclera. It's much bigger. So the sclera diffracts light. Uh, while the cornea doesn't. So here is the typical range, so that's, uh, that's here 400 nanometers, and it turns out that 2D in the cornea is uh, smaller, is about 150 nanometers. So it's just such that visible light is not diffracted, but of course ultraviolet light is, which is not a disadvantage, yeah? And of course in the sclera, uh, everything's diffracted. So just to give you the idea that uh, you can also manipulate light. And I'm not going to talk much about this. These are actuators, because this is a topic that you're going to hear about tomorrow. Uh, these are all uh, plant seeds and uh, various um, uh, plant actuators. And um, they are also based on the architecture of cellulose in the plant cell wall. And since this is going to be a topic tomorrow, I can just uh, leave it at that. So that was a little bit my introduction to uh, what I'm going to say now, because uh, I want to come back to this now and say, well, our architecture, geometric arrangement can generate a broad range of properties, mechanical properties, optical properties, even active mechanical behavior. Now, 
how much can we use this uh, in order to look a little more into uh, the direction of uh, um, longer lifetimes, a smaller variety of materials and so on. And uh, basically, um, let's just go on by saying uh, what I will now try to do is to show you some examples in particular on how to increase the durability of materials. So this is my last point here. Of course, a longer lifetime is also a way of saving energy. And uh, how can we increase the durability of materials, mostly by geometry? Now, uh, here are three things. So I'm sure that Mason, uh, who is, of course, in the audience, will recognize uh, this picture. Um, I'll say just a few words about this. I'll say something about generally about the mechanics of tessellation in a sort of general concept, how this is going to affect as a, as a lifetime and the properties. I'll talk about uh, pseudoelastic proteins and uh, interesting uh, properties that some proteins may acquire that also dramatically increase the lifetime. And finally, I'll talk about maintenance and adaptation, uh, which of course is also a way of increasing lifetime uh, with the example of bone. So I'll try to cover this uh, uh, a little bit in, uh, with a few examples. And well, if you want to read this, as you see, uh, Eve is quarter on some of this. Uh, these are some, some uh, viewpoint articles on these kind of topics. So let me start with the first uh, thing that I want to cover. These are pseudoelastic proteins. Now, uh, so this is primarily work of the group of uh, Matthew Harrington uh, in, in our lab in, in, in Potsdam. And here are two uh, interesting uh, protein-based materials. So one uh, material uh, uh, is, the, is, is uh, the major constituents of these fibers here that uh, muscles, uh, mool, uh, use uh, to fix themselves, to anchor themselves onto rocks in, uh, in uh, wave-swept habitats. So they are getting very challenged by waves. And therefore, uh, they need uh, to anchor themselves onto the rocks. And you can imagine that these fibers, uh, on the one hand, need to be stiff uh, anchor the, um, uh, the muscle to the rock, but in case a very strong wave comes along, it will be very clever to have a material that is also able to dissipate a lot of energy without uh, having the muscle actually being swept away. So I think it's very important to, to have a, a very durable and, uh, uh, um, well, uh, very interesting properties for these fibers. Now, the other example uh, is uh, this egg case here. So these creatures here, these whelks, they put their eyes into uh, cases of that nature. And again, this is, a, um, this is a protein case. And these egg cases just swim around in the ocean. And of course, uh, they don't want to be eaten uh, by whatever swims around in the ocean. So they are made so tough that nobody wants to eat this. Yeah? This is exactly the way you don't want your steak. And therefore, um, uh, so the question is, how do you make a protein so incredibly uh, uh, resistant to, to fracture? And the stress-strain curve of these materials are shown below. These are, uh, this is the load that's applied, and this is the strain. And you see these things are, have cycles. Well, let's look at this material, for example. It's fairly stiff if you start to bite on it. If you bite uh, sufficiently strongly, it starts to deform like crazy, but it doesn't break. It deforms 50, 80 percent. So you steak, you bite in it, it deforms, it deforms, it doesn't break. You stop biting and it just comes back and then you bite again and again and again and it just, just doesn't break. Uh, this one uh, has a slightly different behavior. This is now that fiber that is being stretched. So again, it's very stiff in the beginning. So the muscle holds to the rock until a certain point where the muscle really is teared away from the rock. And again, you have a very large deformation. It means that uh, a lot of energy can be released. The muscle can move away. But interestingly, again, the fiber is not broken. And when it comes back, you see now it has changed properties. It's not like here. It's not a cycle that immediately goes back. 
if you if you wait some time uh, a, a small amount of time it goes back around this curve so now it's the material is 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 much less has a much worse property than it had before in particular the stiffness in the or beginning is gone but if you wait a day it's back to the original so the question is what are the designs for materials such as this and because this of course is a design for uh, damage for durability okay so i said all this now here just to give you sort of a little background on these things so these fibers are as i said made of proteins the major part of this filament is a protein and has a collagen like domain and some some flanking domains uh, uh, that can uh, unfold uh, which i call here the extensible domain and uh, here is another one and this is what builds the fiber so just to give you, I don't go into details, I just give you uh, the, the idea of what's going on, uh, roughly speaking. So here is the connector, this is the collagen, uh, here, is the, here is the deformable region, here is another connector, and now we're going to pull. Here is the, the stress-strain curve, stiff in the beginning, large deformation. So in the beginning you start to pull on these uh, uh, folded domains here, uh, the connector doesn't deform very much, it's just a very stiff connector, but this thing here changes and you see now it starts to unfold. And what these little red connectors, these real red bonds are, these are uh, zinc histidine bonds. So histidine is an amino acid that is able to be cross-linked to an am other amino acid by a metallic ion, which in this case is zinc. So this zinc uh, uh, cross-links these little bonds here. And on unfolding, of course, the covalent chain uh, that goes from one end to the other is still holding. You have, cr you have broken all these red bonds, but you haven't broken the connection between the two ends. And, theref and therefore, and so this is what uh, some people call uh, sacrificial bonds. And uh, on the way back, the sacrificial bonds are still broken. Uh, so now, you, you, if, if, if the whole thing folds back, it has a very, very small modulus because now it's just the unfolding of the protein uh, that holds back. So it's, uh, it has lost its properties. But of course, if you wait an hour or if you wait 24 hours, what's going on is that these red bonds, since it's just a zinc ion that crosslinks these two, the zinc ions finds again its histidines and it crosslinks the whole system again and then we can start all over. So every 24 hours there can be a very, very strong wave during the tide that uh, uh, tears the uh, muscle away and it can recover again within 24 hours, uh, roughly speaking, to get back. And I think this is just, uh, uh, I don't go into any details, this is just as much as we know about this, uh, these arrangements. It's a very, very uh, complex three-dimensional arrangement of the proteins uh, to allow these uh, uh, sacrificial bonds actually to work properly. So geome the geometric arrangement is almost a, a protein crystal. So the geometric arrangement is really very, very important uh, to make this uh, system work. Now a, little, a few comments about the other system. Now how do you make something that's, uh, that's uh, unchewable? Um, so this is the properties. Now, this uh, has, is very interesting. Uh, Eve talked about phase change material. So here is a phase change material. Um, this is a dif this is diffraction uh, at zero percent strain, diffraction at forty percent strain. We just integrate this so they can see it better. So this is the red. This is the green. Not only did the peaks shift, so it means that the protein is being stretched, but uh, actually the completely different peaks have appeared. So somehow this protein underwent a phase transformation. And basically, here is what's going on. This protein uh, at uh, very small strains is in an alpha helical conformation. And an alpha helix uh, is a conformation where hydrogen bonds hold the alpha helix in multiple places together. So there are many hydrogen bonds that hold this helix together. And in fact, there are many segments of, the, of these molecules in a row. So these are, here's an alpha helix, the next, the next, the next. So everything's alpha helical here in the beginning. When we reach the point B, uh, uh, you see that, well, this was rather stiff. 
So all these alpha helices have just extended a bit. So all the hydrogen bonds are still holding, but you have stretched many of those. So there's a little stretch, and of course the strain that's associated with this is very tiny uh, until we reach the point B. And then something happens, a phase transformation occurs, and this phase transformation is actually a transformation from an alpha helix to an extended conformation of that molecule. And that goes into a, this is a sudden transformation. But of course, if the sudden transformation happens only in one of those four, there's a little bit uh, of elongation. If you then uh, transform another one, there is more. And then until you reach the point F, all the segments of that molecule have transformed into the extended conformation. So um, this is completely analogous, by the way, uh, to what's going on in nickel titanium fibers. Uh, that you use to move your teeth around, um, where uh, actually on stretching, you're changing one phase to another phase that has a bigger, uh, that has a bigger lattice spacing, and that allows what uh, people call super elastic behavior. And actually, the nickel titanium model works perfectly for these proteins. So here are uh, two examples of uh, how uh, to use just proteins. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not saying they are, they are, of course, different proteins, but it's at, at the end, it's just protein. And uh, how an arrangement um, with microstructure uh, uh, allows you to make a very uh, um, fracture damage resistant material. This is just a, a historical remark. Uh, is that these fibers, these muscle fibers, actually, not the ones of the, of the usual muscles, but uh, the ones made by these huge uh, shells here, namely Pina nobilis, uh, they were actually used as for textiles. N not uh, not uh, uh, ordinary textiles, but very, very expensive textiles. And um, these fibers here from that Pina nobilis, I mean, this muscle, uh, this uh, shell, sorry, is, uh, is growing uh, in, in near Sicily in the Mediterranean. And it was used uh, until uh, in, the, in the antiquity, in the Middle Ages, uh, as, uh, and was called muscle silk. And uh, these pictures here from an exhibition that was like 10 years ago in, in, in Switzerland by Felicitas Meda. And these are gloves for the Pope. You see the kind of usage uh, that these fibers got. And um, this, is a, this is a tissue that was made. And interestingly enough, again for the, for the history, this tissue has no uh, dyes at all. So it has not been painted. And supposedly, this is the face of the person that was wrapped uh, in, the, in the fiber. It's not known. I don't know if this is just, um, I don't know, some, uh, some small history or whether this is, this is really true. But uh, the idea was that these um, uh, special fibers, they would actually directly copy the the, the picture that was there, and it's not completely impossible because actually, since this is containing zinc, and uh, you have this uh, this zinc histidine bonds, there could be a chemical change, and actually that could happen. But as I said, there is no proof there, and I, I didn't go there to verify. So, but it's an interesting story, even if it's not true. Now let me go back. So this is the pina nobilis. Let me go back quickly to the to the basis of the of the muscle. Because the Pina nobilis is again anchored by these fibers in the ground, but it lives in fairly quiet sea, while uh, the byssus lives in very, very uh, rough uh, um, uh, seashores. And so not only uh, does uh, this fiber require interesting uh, properties for the fiber itself, it also requires uh, to be protected against wear. Now, uh, the, this is the challenge to the engineers in the audience. How do you uh, design a, a wear-resistant coating for a fiber that has to extend by 100%? This is the, this is the challenge that I'm, I'm posing to the engineers here. Well, here is the solution found by the muscle. Um, uh, you look, uh, so this, never mind these pictures here. This is, uh, this is Raman spectroscopy. This is confocal Raman imaging. And you see these bright spots here that look like precipitates. Well, they actually are precipitates, but not of another material. 
This is just uh, the cross-link density. And now the cross-links are just another version of metal coordination bonds, namely these bonds here. This is not zinc now, this is iron that coordinates uh, these dopa uh, catechol, like these dopa uh, um, side chains of amino acids and uh, creates these very, very hard uh, droplets. So they are much harder than the matrix surrounding them. It's the same protein. The dark yellow is the same protein as the light yellow. The only difference is the different cross-link densities, as uh, schematically shown here. And now here is the trick. The trick is you have to design a material that is soft in tension but hard in compression. Now, why is this hard in compression? Well, if I, have, if I have lots of little balls here and I push on them, well, one ball hits the other ball, so this is pretty hard. However, if this goes in tension, uh, the, the ball is hardly deformed. What deforms is the matrix in between the balls. And therefore, here's an extensible material that's hard in compression and therefore suitable as a wear-resistant coating for an extensible fiber. Now this is just, um, this is work uh, from Yael uh, Politi in the lab, and this is just to, um, to make the point that these metal coordination bonds are really very interesting uh, strategies. Uh, in fact, it turns out uh, that just by cross-linking, you can make a protein harder than bone, and uh, just by these cross-links. And uh, one example is here, this is, uh, this is a spider, and um, this is just uh, the device that the spider uses to inject the venom. It's made of chitin, and the prey has a carapace made of chitin. So how do you make chitin harder than chitin? Well, the trick is you, you don't use chitin. You put actually protein in the tip, and the tip of this chitin needle is actually made of protein. And what you see here in this micro CT is the distribution of zinc. It's again the zinc histidine that I was talking about uh, earlier. And in fact, the zinc cross-linked protein is harder than the chitin, and that's actually the hard tip of that injection needle that is actually penetrating then the chitin carapace of the insect or uh, the other arthropod that this uh, spider is eating. So now back, this was just a, a small remark, and so uh, these spheres are also very hard. So this is now uh, sort of the same pictures before, just to emphasize uh, another very interesting aspect of this material. Namely, here is a hard material, uh, namely this dark yellow material, but actually the, the feature that made the trick is that these hard particles are not connected to each other by hard bridges, but by a soft material in between. So actually, the trick here was to take the hard material and separate it into pieces. And even though it's separated in pieces, if you use it in compression, the pieces touch each other, and it is as hard as a, almost as hard as a continuous hard phase. So making things into pieces is an interesting thing. And this is the concept uh, that I'm going to talk now, which is the concept of tessellation which is uh, another very, very common principle uh, in, uh, in, in natural systems. And I mean, I don't know if Mason is going to talk about this, perhaps. Uh, um, in any case, I'll just mention this very briefly. Uh, tessellation means take a hard component, another hard component, and a very thin, um, either nothing or a very thin uh, layer in between, then clearly uh, this small volume here has a very large effect because in compression it's going to be hard, but if you put tension on this, this soft green phase will actually take the tensile load. So this is um, uh, uh, a principle that you can see. So this is a work with uh, Ron Schacher, who is also here. Uh, this is the, the, the shell of the turtle. Now, that's something I, I, I had to learn as a material scientist, is actually that the shell of the turtle is nothing else than bone. It's the thoracic cage that's being transformed into a carapace. So uh, basically, uh, by taking a uh, cross-section through this uh, turtle shell here, you see uh, the ribs. So here's one of the ribs. So normally, if I take my ribs and I would cut them, um, then I would see individual ribs surrounded by soft tissue. Now here is the rib of that carapace, and you see it actually joins up with the next rib that's coming here through this suture. 
But now, if I take, so this, this picture here is, uh, is um, uh, showing in, in bright, it's showing the mineralized bony phase, and in black is soft tissue. Now, this is like uh, playing a maze, yeah? Now I'm taking this arrow, and I'm trying not to, le to cross any white. So I'm, I can go here, 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 here. Oh, I went through it. So these two ribs are joined, but they are not physically joined. There is no bony bridge from one rib to the other. Now, taking now a section through this part of the suture, this is what it looks like. So it's a fingering, it's interdigitated uh, in 3D in a very, very complex way, but you can see that none of the uh, mineralized phase, phase, phase is touching the mineralized phase of the other side of the rib. So it's interdigitated but not connected. So what's the point of interdigitating without connecting? This is, uh, this is the, the, the simplified model of it. Just take the model of my fingers. If I'm putting a soft matrix uh, be between my fingers, you see that at small deformation, this is very soft. While at larger deformation, this now starts th these fingers start to bump into each other. It's getting very stiff. So this is the measured behavior uh, of bone, the measured behavior of bone with a suture. And you see that for, for a while, almost no load uh, happens on bending, and only later this starts when uh, the fingers start to bump into each other. So this is a design for a carapace that behaves very soft when you do small deformations, such as breathing, walking, swimming, but behaves very hard uh, for large deformations if somebody bites on you. So here is another trick on how to use um, tessellation. So this is now a Mason's example. Um, uh, just very, very briefly, uh, these, uh, these tesserae. So, uh, well, I find it amazing that uh, creatures such as sharks have skeletons actually made of cartilage. Now, the properties of cartilage you can test yourself, yeah? This is, a, this, is this, yeah? So the white shark comes along with his big teeth and then has a jaw made of this. You don't believe it, right? Well, there's something that helps. Uh, and uh, these are these, uh, hard, these uh, um, tessellations on the surface of this cartilage that uh, Mason is very interested in. And uh, another one of his pictures where you can see a large uh, view of many, many of those uh, mineralized tiles. Now, just imagine, take, take a rub of cartilage and put ceramics on top. You would like to do this because as soon as you bend this, the ceramics will just break and everything is, is gone. But instead of ceramics, you do what you do in your bathroom. You put tiles. Then you can actually bend, and then the same thing happens as with the extensive uh, abrasive-resistant coating, is that when you're bending on the, on the tensile side, what you're stretching is the soft material in between the tiles, and when you're compressing on the compressive side, the, the, the hard tiles bump into each other, and this is what gives you rigidity. So I think the tessellation is absolutely essential uh, in these bones. So this is mineralized, so this tessellate, um, these tesserae are mineralized cartilage on the surface of cartilage. So here's the, here's the cartoon, Mason's cartoon about this. Uh, uh, on, the, on the compression side and on the tension side, what's going on. So, of course, I, I had to show another picture of Yuri's uh, because now this leads very, very naturally uh, to uh, the concept of these interlocked uh, um, materials that uh, Eve already introduced. And here's one that I like, just made of tetraeders. So put two tetraeders side by side, add another one uh, like this, add another one on top, then slide them in from the side, and so on. This makes a material that is stiff in bending just because the elements in three dimensions lock uh, each other. So if you put nothing, all you need to do is to uh, squeeze them together by some load from outside. Or instead of putting nothing, you can also uh, have some glue, some resin uh, um, sort of impregnating this, and then uh, you have a soft uh, tissue connecting the hard elements. What I find really interesting is that you can actually remove one of the elements and it still holds together. That's what uh, Yuri Estrin is showing here in this, in this panel here. 
So there are lots of interesting concepts that actually, as you can see, can be translated into technological ideas. So let me just uh, push this uh, a little further and uh, uh, go back uh, to some of these glass sponges. So you remember the glass sponge that I showed in the very beginning uh, where the inherent brittleness of glass is reduced by the fact that the glass is separated into individual lamellae. So for those who are not material scientists here, you all know that uh, the way to break glass, you make a scratch and then you just bend and uh, the crack will propagate. But of course, if you have now uh, glass layers of 10 microns glued to each other, you make a scratch, you bend, and uh, the, the crack will propagate 10 microns and then uh, it will have to be nucleated again. So it's obvious that just by subdividing into many, many lamellae, you are dramatically improving uh, or reducing the inherent brittleness of glass. And I mean, this here is, the, is an example of, of such a glass sponge where all the dark lines here are just uh, glue layers in between glass layers. And uh, here are some examples, for example, of how crack, crack propagates in a, in a plain uh, glass biological glass or, for example, in this multi-layered um, glass where you, can, where you see that the cracks don't propagate but stay where you have uh, actually damaged the material. Now, this is a very, very simple-minded, uh, um, very simple-minded concept. So this is, my, this is the telephone book concept. I know the younger people here don't even know what telephone books are because now it's all on, it's, it's all on the web. But uh, in former times, we used books that were thick like this with many, many pages, right? Uh, and then uh, just, just try to think about the difference in the mechanical behavior of a telephone book intention versus a plain piece of uh, paper, yeah? Well, uh, instead of uh, paper, we can, for example, take aluminum sheets. That's one of my colleagues in the OM has done recently and has shown that indeed you get a dramatic increase in strength. So here is the plain material. If you put a crack in this plain material, there's one problem with this that all, everybody in material science knows, is that when you now pull on this, then you get um, an increase of the stress at these tips here, which is actually uh, given by this equation where this, 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 uh, the um, increase in, in, in stress at the tip goes with the square root of the size of this crack. And that's a problem because, of course, if the, if the stress here is larger than what you're applying, then indeed this will actually make the crack propagate. And then uh, you get this very nasty behavior that uh, when the crack just grows, uh, the, the strength is actually coming down. So that's for a completely brittle material uh, such as a ceramic. Now to take this brittle material and now subdivide it into individual sheets, and now I'm putting the exact same length as a crack, just that uh, this, this now cracks one, two, three, four, how many, four of those sheets. Now actually, the only thing that you did by now, if this was a telephone book, you, you have removed four pages of your book, and if you had 1,000 pages, now you have just 996 pages. It's still good, yeah? And actually, the strength just decreases like this. It's a dramatic improvement in the properties just by uh, going from a plain thing to a multi-layer thing. And uh, this can be generalized uh, to uh, materials that have uh, periodically varying, um, periodically varying uh, stiffness and uh, such as, for example, in these, uh, in these glass uh, multilayers or any other multilayers. Turns out you need a minimum contrast, um, like five or so, uh, to really get a, a good effect. But with a contrast of five uh, in terms of elastic modulus between the layers and the, the layers in between, you get a very, very strong reduction in the driving force of cracks across this uh, multilayer. So that's uh, uh, explained in these papers here. So separating materials into pieces uh, is uh, dramatically um, reducing the fragility. Now let me talk about something that I call here pseudo-elasticity, uh, uh, pseudo-plasticity. Now plasticity is known in metals, uh, and in metals plasticity, which is permanent deformation of metals comes from the fact that your periodic arrangement 
of, uh, of uh, uh, atomic layers is, uh, is interrupted by a defect and then you are propagating the defect rather than uh, by changing the, the chemical bonds. Now, how do you translate a concept such as this into a composite material made only of polymers? Now, here is, uh, here is the scheme of a tendon. Uh, not only the turkeys do have these great tendon structures, we also do. <laughs> and mice and all, uh, most animals who have uh, tendons, uh, they actually, these tendons are multi-scale. Uh, and so this is a multi-scale rope. And now um, uh, what uh, you can do, or what we did, in fact, is to use some uh, special physical techniques uh, based on X-ray diffraction at the synchrotron to measure simultaneously uh, the elongation of molecules and fibers and uh, the complete tendon as a function of load. Uh, okay, well, this is the method. Uh, I'm not going into details. Um, I'll just give you the result. So now you, you're stretching your tendon until it almost breaks. And then what, I'm, what we measure in this tendon is that the molecule, which is a triple helical protein, collagen, that this molecule has stretched 1%, that the fibril, which is an assembly of... Uh, these uh, triple helices has stretched 2.4%, while the tendon, which is the assembly of everything, has stretched 15%. So how do you make a fiber uh, where the complete system stretches 15%, the subcomponent stretches only 25 and the subcomponent of the subcomponent only one? That sounds strange. Well, the, the explanation is very simple. Uh, well, you forget, I always need my hands for this to explain. So elongating the sum of my two hands uh, will make me cry, but if I do this, I can easily uh, el elongate the sum of my two hands without any pain. And uh, this means that uh, shear between the fibers is the, is the clue to this. So here is another very interesting effect of subdividing materials into, into, in, into a tessellation because now the surface between the tesserae, or in this case the fibers, allows you shear and therefore a much larger deformation than the individual fiber. This is actually a fantastic way of tuning the stress-strain curve of a, of, a, of a macroscopic material by just changing these, adapting these values by the right materials here, down here, the cross links and so on. So you can actually design the shape of a stress-strain curve in this way. So, uh, this all, the same thing also exists in bone, so this is just an image of, of, of bone, which is also consisting of these collagen fibrils. Uh, the only difference to the tendon is that it's now reinforced with mineral particles. And uh, doing the same, uh, the same study on, uh, on bone, you find that the same is true, that actually a bone is able to deform twice as much as the mineralized collagen fibrils. And the reason is that the interface between these blocks uh, provide the deformation. Uh, in this case, this uh, interface here is made of uh, phosphorylated non-collagenous proteins and also some mineral in it and so on, but not, uh, not as much as on the surface of the collagen. So here are two materials that do this. How universal is this? So you've already, uh, Eve also mentioned wood. By the way, here is your speaker, yeah? <laughs> Fairly tiny compared to this, right? Now, how do you make a material as good as this? Um, well, I think I need to show this because this is now, this is about the holes in material space. I have to spend a minute on this, although it's a little out of the, f folk, the point that I will make later, but still. So if you want to build the highest column with the lowest amount of material, this is what you need to maximize. And here uh, are, is an Ashby map actually collected, I think, by Mike Ashby uh, in a very early paper already uh, with all kinds of materials, engineering alloys. And here is wood in the direction of the fiber. Uh, well, perpendicular to the fiber is not important because it's not used that way in nature. And now, uh, this is a log scale, and uh, this is the line that uh, has constant values of the parameters that I'm interested in. I'm now in increasing this interesting parameter. And you see that, well, 
well, wood is better than anything, at least for this parameter. And this is because the density in wood is so low, and the density in wood is low. You know that wood is floating in water. The density is low because it has the lumen in the center. It has this, uh, it may, it's made of this uh, cylindrical uh, uh, cells. So, but even though the density is low, it still needs a decent modulus. And, uh, and now let's talk a little bit about the modulus and then also talk about a plastic deformation of wood. I don't know if you buy your very expensive uh, uh, Rolls Royce car, yeah? So then you have this wooden, made of real wood, these wooden uh, frames on, in the front of your car. Uh, which, of course, implies that you have to be able to do a um, plastic deformation of wood. There are several mechanisms for that, but here is one. So these wood cells are made of uh, are tubes, essentially, with stiff cellulose fibrils running at a certain angle uh, around uh, the lumen of, uh, of the cell. And if you're pulling this cell, uh, and again, here is a synchrotron experiment that is able to measure this angle. If you're pulling the cell, this piece of wood, uh, in, the, in this direction, what you see is that the spiral angle, which is called microfibril angle, is actually decreasing. It, it goes from 45 to 35 for an elongation of 15%. So I need my arms again. This is a cellulose fibril. This is another cellulose fibril. And now changing the angle see what's going on. It's shear between the fibrils. And this allows plastic deformation. Why does it? Uh, because cellulose fibrils are built in this way. Here is the component, uh, the tessera, the individual stiff component. This is the matrix that surrounds it. But this matrix that surrounds it is in large fraction hemicellulose that has one half of the molecule almost identical to cellulose and is integrated into the fiber. The other part is branched and sticking out. Here is another fiber that has the same principle. And then lots of weak bonds that connect these fibers in between the two stiff components. And of course, if you're able to break some of these bonds and then to reform them in a slightly different position, you have achieved a plastic deformation. And again, like in metals, it was a localized deformation. It's a different physics, of course. Uh, it's not. It's no dislocation, but the the general concept is the same because again the deformation is completely localized. And so people are now. Uh, I'm just showing this from our friends in in Finland. In this case, people are now uh, developing materials based on these ideas and. Uh, by connecting stiff elements uh, with multivalent uh, polymers in between them and so on. So, sorry for the German in that slide, um, but once in a while we write reviews even in German. Um, and so this is just summarizing these pictures, these two pictures are just summarizing uh, two of the um, principles that I showed you before with these uh, fibers and the interfaces between them. So this is the plasticity concept. So here is a fiber that has binding sites with the other fiber. And I'm now shifting one blue fiber against the other blue fiber. And you've seen that, you see that these a bonds A and B now are dangling. But instead, we have bonds C, D, E, F, G that are connected. And if I can count here, if five bonds connected, you have four bonds connected. This is as strong as this but it has been permanently deformed. So this is uh, what I mean with localized deformation in the interface. This is uh, the other example that I showed earlier with the muscle uh, that is uh, attached to the rock. Here the bonds now are, are connecting loops of the same molecule. If you unfold it, uh, the, the molecule stays intact and it can refold and reform. So this is reversible. So this is reversible. Some people call this self-healing. Uh, this is irreversible. You can call it uh, plasticity, if you wish. I, I skip this because of time. And I'll, I'll uh, finish uh, with um, a last comment about adaptation and maintenance. 
talking about uh, a little bit more about bone. So um, basically, um, bone has in in our body has a very interesting ability, namely to renew itself permanently. So approximately every five to seven years or so, you have a new skeleton, completely new. And um, the interesting thing is that this renewal is not completely random. Um, actually, I'll, I'll show the next slide first. I'll show you this first. So, so these are the actors uh, during that renewal. Uh, in this histological slide, this up here, that's a little pink, this is mineralized bone. Uh, this is a newly formed bone matrix. It has a different color because it doesn't have mineral yet. This is going into it later. These are cells called osteoblasts. Let me put some arrows. They are adding uh, new material. And you see they're sitting here in this row. They are synthesizing collagen, putting it down here and making this matrix. Some of these cells stay behind. They differentiate to osteocytes and stay uh, within the bone. This is an osteoclast that actually removes bone. It eats it away. Uh, it's actually very difficult to eat away bone because the mineral needs uh, very acidic environments that's made by these cells. So you realize that you have actors removing, actors adding, and you have a sensory system here. So this is a classical uh, actuator sensor system embedded in a material that renews constantly. And that's why I call this an adaptation and maintenance cycle, because this set of cells actually uh, renew the bone constantly. And actually, they do so by removing bone primarily where uh, the bone is weakened, either by damage or because there is a specific uh, unusual load coming along. So this uh, cycle replaces damaged material, thus preventing fatigue. So this is a way of avoiding fatigue, is to just re remove damaged uh, spots. It also allows to adapt to the loading situation. I'll say a word about this. And uh, this is less important here, but very important for us uh, uh, as uh, uh, creatures. It mobilizes and stores calcium and phosphate, because this is our main storage for these ions. OK, you've seen this. Uh, now, here is just the example of what uh, this um, controlled remodeling is actually doing. This is just a human vertebra uh, as a function of age in a, in a fetus immediately after birth and in an adult. Black is bone, white is bone marrow, and it's a cross-section approximately around here through one of the vertebrae. Now, look at this. Um, so. Now, in terms of engineering, you find uh, immediately that this makes sense because uh, you have struts uh, vertical and horizontal. Actually, the loads are uniaxial, essentially. So uh, vertical struts are good uh, to sustain the vertical uniaxial load. And actually, the horizontal struts are there uh, to prevent uh, buckling of the uh, vertical uh, direction. That's at least what people say. By the way, uh, this changes a lot with osteoporosis. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this. But just as a small remark, in osteoporosis, primarily the horizontal struts go away because they are less critical than the vertical ones for the type of loading that we put. But interestingly enough, in the fetus, this arrangement is not vertical horizontal. It's, it's, uh, it's central. It's radial. It goes from a center outwards, as you can see. So it's a completely different topology. And if you just look at what's happening at birth, you still have some remains of that uh, uh, central arrangement, but it's remodeled into vertical horizontal. I didn't discover this, obviously. This is known uh, 100, since 150 years. And I think I'll, I'd like to show this slide because that's a very early collaboration between an engineer and an anatomist. So von Meyer uh, Kuhlmann, uh, Swiss engineer, building bridges uh, and uh, recognizing uh, these, the fact that the arrangement of these uh, trabeculae are actually following the stress directions. Julius Wolf, an anatomist in Berlin at the Charité, uh, he uh, discovered the same thing. Plus, what he also noticed that if there was a fracture in a, in a piece of bone, and the fracture healed badly means with the bones not put in the right place, 
you will get a rearrangement of the architecture that would actually adapt to this not abnormal situation. So even though the situation was abnormal, the, the bone would remodel in such a way that it would cope best possible with this abnormal situation. And these are some of the original drawings uh, of what happened in these uh, particular fracture cases from the 1870 book. So in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, materials, uh, this adaptation and maintenance cycle is basically small scale recycling, really. Now, just a word about what really healing is, bone healing. This is not small scale recycling. This is large scale recycling. Because now uh, the body really synthesizes bone where there is normally no bone in the form of a callus here. Uh, this, uh, this is what thickens the bone for a while until the fracture is healed when this callus is being removed again through this normal adaptation and maintenance cycle. So I'm just mentioning that this is a complex process where bad material is deposited first, good material is, is added on top of the bad material, and at the end everything is removed. It's a very uh, complex, intricate process that looks like uh, um, bricolage, uh, more or less, yeah? <laughs> really. So uh, I'm concluding here um, and uh, showing you again these uh, three boxes that uh, we had before. So basically, um, these uh, examples here of the tessellations, this is really damage resistance. These are material that are designed in such a way that it's very difficult to damage them. You can chew on them, they never break. You can, uh, 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 tessellation is a very, very uh, typical example. Uh, then some materials are designed for damage tolerance. So even though they have lots of cracks, they still function. Uh, and um, finally, uh, when I talk about maintenance and repair, this is really uh, recycling uh, at the small scale, continuous recycling at the small <coughs> scale and large scale recycling uh, later. So you see there are lots of strategies around to make materials more durable. I think um, probably a lot of this uh, can be translated into engineering. Although I'm not uh, optimistic to the point that I think that any of this can be translated directly. It's at best inspiration, I hope. Um, it's not solutions for us. And the reason is very simple. If you find a solution that is supposed to optimize a certain problem, you have to take boundary conditions into account. And obviously the boundary condition of nature are very different to the boundary conditions of the engineer prices, availability of materials, uh, synthesis, and so on and so on. So it would be very surprising if any of these natural systems could be translated directly. But I think at least the strategies are being worth looked into. Thank you.